Thank you, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Bruno Mark, an opinionated Swiss. And this is the Liebe Reine, an opinionated Austrian. Yes. You know, I, can't, I can't actually say anything bad about him. He's a nice Austrian person. He's not German. <laughs> okay. All right, we're going to talk about this letter today. Uh, you may know it by three possible names. Um, I, uh, I don't like the word SZ, uh, you'll hear later why. Uh, I also German double S, completely misleading name. Um, it's like saying French fries, and when everyone knows they're from Belgium, right? So, yeah, but, uh, but, <coughs> but Reine, Reine, this is, this is totally futile conversation because I don't really care. <laughs> but I do, honey. So, uh, so I call it the sharp S. What is the sharp S uh, for those of you who do not speak German? And I think there's one of, or one or two of you here in this room. Uh, it's the difference between, um, uh, in German, the difference between the voiced and unvoiced S z sound is uh, um, important. Um, for instance, in this pair, the difference between reisen, travel, and reisen, rip. Uh, um, is only in the voiced and unvoicedness of the S, right? Um, so that's why we need a sharp S. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it's a stupid S. Yeah. It doesn't even look like an S. Why would you want to put that up there? You know, it's got nothing to do with S. You know, this is, this is only the Germans can do this. You know, no other, minute, no other civilized Austrians. nation on this planet would do this. You know, so. If you, go, if you go to the next slide, my, my dear friend, you know, the Swiss are sensible people. We have a great banking system, we have an old democracy, and we have a sensible version to the, what they call the German double S, or the, the sharp S. We use S's, letters that everyone on this planet can recognize. <clears throat> yeah, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, not so quick. Okay, uh, give you a quick rundown uh, on the orthography of the sharp S. Um, uh, first, uh, to one thing, there is no such thing as one correct German, uh, one correct standard German, um, because German has its root in something called the dialect continuum, uh, that in, in, in the Middle Ages that continued into the Dutch-speaking, uh, what today is the Dutch-speaking area, including this town here. Um, and uh, so it was quite a feat to accomplish a common orthography, which was first done in um, the 20th century. Um, and the old orthography, uh, as it's usually referred to, there were a lot of small orthography reforms, but uh, uh, the one generally referred to as the old orthography was the one uh, in effect until um, around 2000. And the rules for using the sharp S were, uh, it's a sharp S sound, sharp meaning unvoiced, uh, after a long vowel, um, as opposed to the double S, after, uh, which is a sharp S sound, after a short vowel. And, uh, but there were exceptions, uh, lots of exceptions, so in the end there were more sharp S's after short vowels than after long vowels in the old orthography. And um, for instance, at the end of a syllable or a word, or uh, before a consonant. Okay, <laughs> but that, that already shows you know, that Again, if you were a sensible nation with a sensible language, you know, you wouldn't have more exceptions than rules. That's why we have which the new orthography, right? Exactly, which exactly <laughs> defeats the point of the, the German double S in, or sharp S in the first place. Mm. So they're getting rid of the exceptions and making double S's, yeah. which is exactly the Swiss point, which is what the Swiss have been banging on about. Well, it's true that there, um, uh, the amount of sharp S is significantly, significantly diminished after the, the new orthography, but it did not disappear completely, just it's a little more consistent, like always after a long <laughs> <laughs> um, And uh, there is a, a very new addition ever since last year. Uh, we, uh, when you capitalize, or when you set, uh, set in all caps, there used to be no sharp S, right? Uh, at least not in official orthography, so uh, you would have to replace it with a double S. And, but now what you can do, you can also, it's both is possible, you see that here, uh, you can also use a cap sharp S. Beautiful. Hmm? No, 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 but, but, but no, again, it's slightly stupid, you know. For the last 700 years, or at least for the last 130 years since the Rechtschreiber reform, you know, or the standardization of German, you know, the Germans have been using happily 
two S's in the capitalized version. And no one has actually bothered about it. And that someone has come and put this abomination in capitalization. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that's the, the, the Swiss orthography is everything is, is like exactly the, the, the German orthography except for the sharp S, which is abolished in Switzerland and Liechtenstein, I think. Uh, one of the last well. remaining yeah. dictatorships in, in uh, Europe. <laughs> so, yeah. But, I have but, to, but wait I have a minute. Wait a minute. No, the Swiss orthography. You know, again, Switzerland is also. Switzerland, <laughs> very sensible people. They actually haven't been teaching the German double S or the, the sharp S since the about 1930s. And in about 1940s, the sharp S was abolished altogether in all printing, in all books and everything. And there's a number of reasons for it. One is Swiss orthography and how, uh, how syllables actually combine. And another reason is that Switzerland has three, well, actually four official languages. But back in the 40s, with typewriters, they needed to put three official languages, German, French, and Italian, on a typewriter keyboard. And by sacrificing the, the sharp S, it was possible to add more language support. Which makes perfect sense, because everyone can read two S's. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You'd need a sharp S. So here I have found six cases in German language where the difference between double S and sharp S, remember, double S of the short vowel, and uh, sharp S after long vowel makes a difference. For instance, the first line, masse versus masse. Um, for instance, if I were to say to you or write to you, uh, Bruno, kann ich deine Masse wissen? <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I know your mass or measurements? <laughs> hmm, what do you think? <laughs> well, I give you my mass. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay, I grant you that one. Good, okay. So the, but what about Flosse? which is a fin on a fish, right? And flosse, which is the third case singular of, uh, what is it called, a raft, to the raft, it means. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, there's, there's no, no, no thing I can no. come up with. Okay, busse and busse. Um, uh, busse means buses, right? And busse means penalty. Um, so if you don't have a ticket, you have to take the busse or busse. Well, if you don't have to take, if you don't have a ticket, you don't go on to the busse, ah, because then yeah. you won't get the busse. All right, all right, three nil. Um, by the way, uh, as, as, this is pronounced as in German, the left one. <clears throat> this is not English, it means ace. And as, he or she ate. Okay. <laughs> okay, Russen, Russians, and Russen. Uh, to produce zut, you know, like a candle. To, yeah. um, uh, I can't think of a sentence. Can anyone See. of the German speak? No. Yeah. Okay. And, and okay. If, anyone right. con if anyone confuses a verb with a noun <laughs> with a Russian, I think exactly. I think they have a, generally a language issue, you know, and they shouldn't be really be discussing s's in the first place. Bam, bam, yes. Noun. Versus, but, yeah, but you cannot confuse versus the verb. You know, if you don't get that, beim, then you shouldn't be speaking at all. Beim Russen <laughs> cannot be beim Russen. I beim den Russen beim Russen. Ha! I, I win one point. Okay. <laughs> but the Russen, the Russen sing your nouns, no? But, but singular, singular Russian. If you watch the Russians at the Russian, which doesn't make any sense. But uh, <laughs> same thing with. Yeah, yeah. But the sentence doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah. I, w I, I want to see you do that. Okay. You see, but for the Swiss, that's not an issue. It's, it's grammatically possible, but the sentence makes no. The context makes no sense. Yeah. You want to go? Do you see the Russians at the Russian? That that wouldn't make any sense. That would be the alternate option. But okay, we don't. We only have twenty minutes, so we have to. Sh um, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I have 10 more examples, sorry. <laughs> okay, same thing with Schoss und Schoss. Uh, it's hard to, I, I didn't find a context yes. where it would really make sense to confuse this. Yeah. Two. Okay, so I grant you that. I have to um, concede. Uh, it's true, you can live without a sharp S. It's true. But <clears throat> that's not an option for us type designers. We have to put it in. We have a slot to Okay, find, I, right? I grant you certain romanticism here. <laughs> So let's talk about the shape of the sharp S. <clears throat> There's a couple of um, 
uh, possible concepts. Uh, and one I like to call the Chichold way, which is the predominant one, unfortunately. <clears throat> exactly. I mean, you're all probably familiar with Chichold's theory that the German Dr. Sharp S is a ligature between the long S and the short, the short S. And that's been going around for a long, long time, but in the last couple of decades or so, that has been soundly refuted. You know, that actually the sharp S comes from somewhere totally different. However, however, I do believe that you know we shouldn't completely rule out Chichold's idea or negate it completely because we have examples where there is actually a ligature version of a long S sharp and short S as well, which which can be, or which is, a sharp S, you know. Yeah, you see here the famous German poet uh, Vespasiano Amfiario <laughs> using the sharp S uh, after a long grandissimo, which is a famous German word. Yes, no, the, this, this thing, this has a tradition, it's true, but it comes from Italian or Latin uh, scripture. Which again shows uh, that you know, everyone but the Germans are more sensible people. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll skip that. Um, the, uh, the one thing, and I think this has been a little forgotten, uh, the works of Max Bollwage, uh, and he, um, he actually tried to prove Chichold's point, right? Um, and, and, uh, and he tried to find proof in medieval writing, medieval German writing, uh, for finding the long S, uh, round S combination, but he hardly found any of these. What he did find, though, uh, was a long S with, um, with a hook on it. And uh, this stems from a, um, a Latin abbreviation. You see here on the left side, uh, the, um, an, an excerpt from the Gutenberg Bible, the word servos in the second line, which means the slaves. And the S with the hook was the abbreviation for the syllable ser. Right? Um, and in about the same time in German handwritings, you will find a long S with the same hook on it uh, to signify the voiceless S. And, and so this was probably taken over in the same time. But uh, and you can tell also the, uh, the abbreviation was also used in German. So here you see on the left side this, the word unser, U, N, and the S with the hook, standing for ser. Um, unser meaning ours, and uh, and he also found proof um, that this th thing you put on the right side, be it a hook or be it another kind of abbreviation, because there were different uh, things in use, um, are not a Z. So that's why I wouldn't call it a Z. Um, and you see here that the the that, uh, the Z it has a completely different shape um, in in this typeface, for instance. Um, um, yes. And even uh, what sometimes brought us a counter-argument, uh, I think the, uh, this was, if, if you want to look for it, uh, this was Guten, uh, in the Gutenberg Jahrbuch of 1999. Unfortunately, only in German. It was never translated to English. Um, and there was a, a, a response to it um, by uh, an, another researcher with, whose name I just forgot, sorry, uh, Berkle. Berkle, two years later, in the Gutenberg Jahrbuch of uh, 2001. And he mentioned the Wolf Dietrich uh, frag, uh, fragment. And there's a couple of Wolf Dietrich uh, uh, handwritings. And uh, even in those, I would argue, um, uh, and he, he very selectively picks his uh, um, examples, even in those, I would argue that there's a difference between the, uh, the voiceless S with the marker and the Z. <coughs> yes, so uh, the, uh, according to Paul Wager, and I, I tend to believe him, in this case, uh, the S is, um, stems from a long S with an abbreviation attached to it. And uh, like abbreviations like what you see on, on this word um, omnique um, on, on the right. So the M with the dash on top uh, replaces the N, M, N. And the Q with this hook on the side, which is not a Z, um, and is uh, short for que. And you sometimes still see like um, uh, HN-shaped sharp S's uh, around. So for those of you who have been to uh, Raabs in Austria, and I recognize a few familiar faces from there, uh, you, you can find this in the Schlossstraße in Raabs. And you see two sharp S's uh, with, the, with, the, with an old hook form. 
And uh, what is true is that, uh, especially in the 16th century, you see uh, punch cutters often trying to unify the, the shape of, of this attached hook with uh, the set, because they were similar enough to make them completely uh, um, or very similar uh, in the punches. But uh, to say that, um, that it is the set up over uh, is like saying that the lowercase d is a CL ligature. Well, there are typefaces where it, you could argue that the uh, lowercase d looks like a CL ligature, but no one would ever, maybe you would claim that it's a CL. <laughs> <laughs> so, my conclusions from Bollwage, sharp S is not a ligature. It's not a ligature, it's a letter by its own. Um, the, the historically most correct shape is with a hook on the right side, um, an inward hook, and uh, I would suggest to stop calling it SZ because there's no Z in the SZ. But I your microphone is dead. <laughs> you have just given us a very long and elaborate explanation where the sharp S is coming from, you know, with this little squeak, squeak, squiggly thing, right? So, but really, if we look at it, it's a diacritic. You know, if, if you're honest about it, it's a diacritic, not a letter. So, other sensible people, like the French, for example, who we know are very, very keen on their language, Years and years and years ago, they have abolished accents above capitals. You don't need to do that anymore. You can get away without it. So I would argue, since that is a diacritic, we can get rid of it and just have two S's and make everyone's life. I have to take away this microphone again. I'm sorry. So, uh, <laughs> OK. Um, so about my uh, lowercase sharp S form um, to, the, to, the, to describe the, the shape. This is the stuff that everyone agrees upon, the long S part of it. Uh, but I argue that uh, the three shape on the right side makes much more sense because you have fewer spacing problems on the right. Because uh, with the uh, round S on the right, you, you have to handle four horizontals, which makes no sense. And you, you have a huge gap on the side. What you can also do is add a serif there, even in a sans serif typeface, according to Jost Hocholi. Um, uh, because he says that the long S was written like this. And, uh, and this is the only serif you find in his sans serif typeface Allegra, by the way. Um, which takes us to the shape of the capital sharp S. Um, so, uh, for the capital sharp S, I would say there are... <laughs> Don't get me started! Don't get me started! Uh, I'll get you started, all right. So, um, I, uh, I think there's four conditions uh, that apply. Uh, one is that it must be a cap shape, so it must fit into what we've learned about the brush stroke order when you draw uh, capital letters. Uh, it must be legible, uh, so it must be distinguishable from other letters, that's clear, uh, like for every other uh, letter shape. It must be popular enough, so it must be instantly recognizable for a, by a broad public, as a sharp is, and it must fit the uppercase, lowercase relations uh, like the rest of the alphabet does. Let, let's say, imagine like the uppercase E and the lowercase E is like a very quick cursive way to draw these three horizontals, right, in one go. So you have to be able to kind of derive the lowercase sharp S from the uppercase sharp S. So we have to reverse engineer um, what, you uh, what you derive it from. Now, um, Adam, a couple of months ago, posted this. Um, so he, he had a look at uh, the, the shapes that are in use. And um, looking at these, um, these two create an impossible <laughs> angle, which works in an ultralight, but in any other situation, impossible. So these are ruled out uh, from the start. So don't even need to talk about this. This is so ridiculous. Um, then the other thing is, should we have uh, the round thing at the top, or should we have the hard thing at the top, soft or hard at the top left? Now, um, there has been, I, you probably know this uh, as well, uh, uh, Andrea Stötzner posted this, um, and I argue that this thing at the top left is not a cap shape, because you cannot do that with a regular brush order, which, uh, so not all four conditions are true, which by ex negativo leaves uh, that shape, and I believe um, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's my preferred one. Uh, the way you could also argue, just like the long S is an F without a, a crossbar, you can do the same thing with the cap F, just get rid of the crossbar and add the uh, hook to it. And then you get your uh, cap sharp S. And 
Uh, these are the, the capture addresses in, uh, in, in, my, in the fonts of my foundry, and I tested them with my parents, uh, who have no idea about type design and have no idea about the uh, thing, and they all instantly recognized it as a sharp S, could read it right away, um, and uh, um, yeah, and we also... Oh yes, we also tried this. Yes, indeed. Um, you, you, you were talking about this, actually. Ah, oh, yes. Yes. Uh, the, the recently, uh, Bruno and I, when we prepared this two months ago, um, we, we tried possible different shapes. And you see here, uh, I think in the recent discussions on Twitter, there was uh, Mona's um, uh, approach to it, to kind of take that F without the crossbar and add a Z to it. Why a set? Because it's not a set in a set. So, um, but uh, we tried it as well, and we uh, we dismissed it uh, right away because it looks too much like T set, uh, and uh, which are very common uh, German combination. Yes. Or I have to switch, you know, be like Swiss, be sensible, you know. <laughs> also, by abandoning the German sharp S, double S set, or whatever you want to call it. We're going to free up two Unicode slots, which we can actually use for useful stuff. Uh, I don't know what to say about this. Okay, thank. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, so. thank you, Bruno. And, uh...